Welcome to Relationships as Spiritual Practice, Bridging the Secular and Spiritual, with your host, Lachelle Lo Chardet, founder of Mindful Compassionate Dialogue and Wiseheart PDX. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you for taking the time out in your day to hmm, focus on something that will support you on your path to transformation, growth, empowerment, and freedom. Glad you're here. Today, I'm happy to say I have with me a colleague who lives here in Oregon. Her name is Sarah Payton. And so we're here together going with the flow today, seeing what arises and sharing with you what comes up, what we imagine would support you on your path. Do you want to say hi, Sarah, and a little bit about oh, who you are? You. And Yeah, thanks for having me, Michelle. I'm yeah. Sarah, and I'm a certified trainer of nonviolent communication. And my love and my passion is how does relational neuroscience inform our nonviolent communication practice? which mm -hmm. takes this directly into deep understandings of what trauma does to the brain and how nonviolent communication can help us. Ooh, yay. So important. I'm so glad you're doing this important work and diving into the complexity of the brain and seeing how we can have this body serve our social and spiritual and emotional well-being. Thank yeah. you for all you've invested. Thank you. Yeah. And also you have a book called Your Resonant Self. Yes, right? I do. I have a book yeah. called Your Resonant Self. Ah, you're going to show. Your Resonant Self workbook. And I have affirmations for turbulent times. Yeah. So those are fun books that are all about what we'll be talking about today. Yay. I love it. What if we start with that concept of resonance? I use that word a lot. I really enjoy that word. And that for me, it really describes hmm, being in alignment with my values and also being in alignment with something larger guiding me, as well as being resonant with my students as we work together. What, what does that word signify for you? I'm guessing there's uh, yeah, something I, special for you. I chose it because of Daniel Siegel. Yeah. Who, the fellow who did the kind of the introduction of the idea of interpersonal neurobiology that we get to study what brains do in relationship with one another. And he said, mm -hmm. resonance is what makes humans work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What makes humans relax. It's what allows humans to have a sense of being understood by one another when they are resonating with one another. Mm -hmm. and it's, it, it's like the, we are, we are so often thinking that humans are one person systems, but huh. they are not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, say more about that. Person systems. Humans are two person systems and three person systems. Mm. One of the things I love about humans is that they have little sensors in their skin that are entirely devoted to picking up whether or not they can feel uh body warmth from other humans wow yeah wow. These, these are little heat sensors that don't light up if it's hotter than human and don't light up if it's colder than human they only light up if it's human it's if it's in the human skin temperature holy smokes i didn't know that is a beautiful yeah. little fact to yeah. literally programmed to sense each other yeah literally Yes, and of course, that's of huge importance for us during a pandemic time, when many of us have had very little skin yes. to skin, body heat to body heat, mm. nourishing, we get, we get hungry. Mm. Mm. And what when we do sense, is there something more there in a pattern when we do sense that human temperature yeah. zone? What are those little sensors then? They trigger a, an effect there? That's a great question. They do. They tell us that we don't have to be on alert. They tell us that we're safe. <sighs> they tell us that we can turn down our energy production because we've got shared energy production with mm -hmm. other humans. Whoa, wow. I, I really like that last bit. 
really speaks to why we relax when we really have good collaboration, right? Like good collaboration, good mm. presence, good listening, all the things that mm. you yeah. Mm. Mm. And maybe a good reminder right now as we're doing so much online and grateful, obviously we're online here and grateful for this technology and at the same time emphasizes the incredible importance of being with others and feeling that resonance and connection. Yeah. Mm. Mm. What else? What else can you say about this word resonance? Well, I really love the word resonance in the context of cellos. <laughs> ah, you play the cello, maybe. <laughs> what I love yeah. about cellos, cellos are about the size of a human torso. Ah. And their sound range is the sound range of the human voice. And hmm, when interesting. You play notes on a cello. You can, I can feel the cello vibrating when the notes are played on it. And you can feel the vibration in your own body. But if I were another cello, then the note that's being played on this cello would cause me to vibrate at the same tonal frequency mm -hmm. that I'm playing on, on the first cello. Uh -huh. And our human body, that, that's musical resonance. Yeah. And our human bodies do this with emotions. Emotions are the music that plays on us, the way that life that life plays on humans, the way that music is played on cellos. Mm. So, so we as humans are, are exquisitely made to vibrate at one another's emotional tonal frequencies. Mm. And of course that can be tricky because if you grow up in a household where everybody's angry, then you're resonating with the anger. Or if people yeah. who are angry are making other people afraid, you're yeah. resonating with the fear. Yeah, yeah. So sometimes people, or if you have a parent who's so sad and never moves out of their sadness, the child is resonating with the sadness all the time. So. Yeah. So for very good reasons, humans learn to, to turn off their perception of their own resonance. Mm. They're still resonating with each other. Research mm -hmm. shows us that if person A is having an emotional experience, person B is having, a, that there's some contagion of that emotional experience. But what, what we do is we, we turn it off mm. the input below the neck in order to not know that we are resonating yeah so that we can survive being in families where the emotional experience is stuck and painful yeah yeah and i'm guessing when that cutting off happens it's a generalized cutting off so if we're doing that we're missing out on resonance with joy and love and peace and all these other what we might call positive emotions right right and all that access to resource that comes with touching into the living energy of needs the way we do in nonviolent communication mm -hmm. the way that that wonderful portland area trainer taught uh, susan sky taught about mm. the energy of needs mm. and how needs have their own vibrational quality yeah of course yeah and what happens when we're resonating let's say with what we would call positive experience positive emotion so can you name some other effects in the brain and the body as that resonance becomes accessible yes yes when people experience a sense of emotional safety so when 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 we have enough um support and resource in the system so that emotions are safe to have, then we begin to notice a movement in the nervous system out of what is traditionally called fight, flight, and freeze, but which I call fight, flight, alarmed, aloneness, and freeze. Mm. Yeah, that we start to move into what Stephen Porges calls social engagement. And when we're in social engagement, so many things happen. When we're in social engagement, our, uh, our 
fine, the fine feed to our facial muscles uh, starts to happen. And we, we kind of begin a, an exquisite dance of mirror neurons to mirror neurons, kind of mapping and tracking mm. each other's emotional facial expressions. Mm. Uh, muscles are uh, around the vocal box release and uh -huh. the voice itself becomes more melodic, more alive, more expressive uh -huh. of emotion. The bronchi in the lungs open and we start to breathe and get more oxygen. The red blood cells themselves pick up more oxygen and carry it throughout the system. Uh -huh. And the immune system starts to produce the cells that fight viruses and fight cancer. Uh -huh. So it's quite a, a huge range of things. Everything changes, basically. Every cell mm. in bodies change in response to mm. the, the experience of, uh, of resonance being safe. And I wouldn't even say that it has to be positive emotions, uh -huh. that it can be all the emotions, as long as there's a sense that they're uh, that they make sense, that they're contextualized, mm. that anger is linked with love, mm -hmm. that, um, that the truth of people's experience is being acknowledged, that people's truth telling is being mm -hmm. received and accepted. All of these mm -hmm. things are part of what create the neuroception of safety. Mm -hmm. The telling of truth creates the mm -hmm. neuroception of safety as long as it's as long as it's modulated. Hmm. Uh, so that it's not a cruel telling of truth, but rather the yeah. grounded, you know, needs-based tellings of truths. That, yeah. yeah. Hmm. Hmm. That seems super important, that contextualization, meaning, truth. Yeah. Can we go back a little bit? Mm -hmm. What if we go back to that cutting off and... Someone listening says, I know I do that. I know that's a habit and I don't have access right now to change that habit. And I want access. I want to be free of feeling cut off from myself and my ability to perceive resonance and engage. Yes. What, what do you say there about opening okay. that? Well, first of all, just a ton of gentleness for this self. Mm. I, I love the humor and the self-compassion and self-warmth that lives in the James Joyce quote about the man, I can't remember his last name, but Mr. Somebody who lives 10 feet from his body. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, oh, yeah, sometimes Mrs. Sarah lives 10 feet yeah. from his body. Of course. <laughs> Sarah. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, uh, so the very first thing is is self warmth and of courseness. Like, mm -hmm. of course, I don't turn on my body because it was not fun when I was little to know my resonance was happening. Sure. So, like acknowledging and contextualizing it rather than thinking there's something wrong with us. Or the other thing that can happen is if no people in a child's life ever talk to them mm -hmm. about their body sensations mm. and it's like it becomes a transgenerational habit mm. mom and dad and grandma and grandpa yeah. and great, great, great grandpa did not talk about bodies that was not okay yeah so nobody does and nobody ever acknowledges that there's any link between a stomach ache and being bullied at school right Stomach mm -hmm. ache, we get out the Pepto Bismol and we just go to school rather than having that warm inquiry about what the heck are our bodies telling us with their pains. Mm -hmm. So, acknowledging first, if we notice that in ourselves that we're cut off, and you know, it might not be all the time, but we notice uh, not to the level we enjoy for certain. First, just to say, hey, I'm cut off and that's okay, there's nothing wrong with me. And there could be lots of reasons for that. Yeah. So I don't have to justify my experience of feeling cut off with some sort of analysis of my past and know no. what that was. No, no. Yeah. Need. yeah. We just get to be so, so sweet with ourselves. And then the next thing is, and I discovered this myself. <laughs> um, I started NVC with zero sense of my own body. No one had ever talked to me about my body. Plus, it was very dangerous in my household to have the yeah. residents turned on. So I had zero people like, what's happening in your body? I'm like, what body? What the heck are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. And it, yeah. 
it took maybe 10 years before I realized that what they were talking about were subtle symptoms of digestion that I could feel, mm. but that I had never put together with that that was what people were looking for. Mm. So part of what's mm. part of the discovering the body sensations is start to go, oh, those body sensations, those completely unimportant rumblings in my gut, those will tell me something. They count. <laughs> Nice. So coming to them is quite a, an interesting mm. thing sometimes that's all it takes mm. is for to go oh now the sensation from the intestines is supposed to be uh it's kind of a a sense of a gentle pulsing and just a, a sense of like the possibility of movement just mm. like oh is it is it, does it feel a little bit like alive in there? And if it feels a little bit alive in our tummy, then usually what that means is that we feel pretty safe. Hmm. Now, hmm. the other thing we can feel is constrictions or places where the digestion stops. We can feel a little bit of cramping. We can feel just a tightness or a rigidity or a sense of immobility. Mm -hmm are signs that for some reason or other our digestion has stopped mm -hmm. and that is the other thing that happens with the neuroception of safety that's one of those cellular changes with social engagement is our digestive system gets to work because oh. we're sending the all clear all safe message to it <laughs> rather than if we're experiencing stress it's a message to saying stop working stop working we don't want you to work we want to send all our energy to thinking and fighting and running yeah cool. and getting connected with others and finding safety that's the whole focus and then once we find it we can stop and digest yeah. the problem being that in our daily lives where there is so much stress people are mostly under stress almost all the time we're sending constant do not go messages to our bellies. Yeah, with that stress. Yeah. The so let me, yeah. Can I go back a little bit? Yeah, yeah. So I really want to highlight because it, it just really strikes me as just gracefully simple that maybe a first baby step is to name the sensations you have and see them as valid and important. Yeah. 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 And, and you're kind of showing with stomach how, how it is important. Mm -hmm. And the first point is your sensations matter no matter what they are. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, I like and, it. And the next place that we can go to is, you know, how's our breathing? And this is something that we may need to pay a little more attention to. Because we may never have, if we're under constant stress, mm -hmm. we may almost never breathe deeply. Yeah. Yeah, because that's a part of the of staying vigilant is mm -hmm. not relaxing and breathing deeply, but rather sort of constantly holding our breath a little bit mm -hmm. to make ourselves stay focused under stress. Yeah. yeah. And so it's part of the flow of cortisol that makes us tense up there and so to start to notice, you know, how what's happening with the ribs, what's happening with the with the sense of the heart in there? Mm -hmm. What's happening with the lungs? What's happening with the diaphragm? Mm -hmm. And then the next two areas are the throat. And sometimes people get a lot of information from their throat, mm -hmm. tight or hot or constricted or like feeling like there's a lump in it. Mm -hmm. The final place that the vagus nerve gives us information from for our emotions and for resonance is the face and the facial expression, the fine muscles of the face. And often, if people have not had much experience with, with body sensations, they can still kind of feel where their face is squinchy. And yeah. that gives them a place to start because those are body mm -hmm. sensations too. Huh. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and we have so many resources around breathing. And at the same time, I'd like to hear from you about that moment, and maybe someone's listening and they're like, yeah, I hear deep breathing, deep breathing, but whatever, I can't do it. So 
right? And maybe they feel frustrated. You have like a very simple practice that they can try to help release the lungs and the diaphragm. Um, what I really like is a little bit of self-resonance, like, well, of course I'm stressed out. <laughs> <laughs> of course I'm hypervigilant. Just like that self-accompaniment, that understanding of the self that we make sense no matter what we're doing. Yeah. Of course I've never relaxed since I was, you know, two years old. Things have been pretty fraught since I was two years old. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that sort of self-warmth. And then the next thing is... Um, uh, that, that that the breath is to know that the breath kind of goes down into the whole torso it, it, with the way the diaphragm moves with breath. It's kind of like a whole balloon. I mean, it's 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 spongy, so it's not a balloon. But <laughs> but it, but when we breathe in, there's not really a stopping place. It feels like there's supposed to be a stopping place somewhere around the, around the diaphragm. And that's what we'll kind of use as a foundation point to keep ourselves hypervigilant. Mm -hmm. But the breath itself just goes all the way into us. Mm -hmm. And if we start to kind of say, oh, and there really isn't an obstruction, you know, it may feel like there's an obstruction, but there really isn't. It just, there's a whole flow in, yeah. flow out. You know? mm. It's fun to, really fun to, to get to see and to experience. There are, there are wonderful little video clips that have animations of the breath coming in. Mm. Mm. in your, on your site, you mean? Or? I don't have it on my site, but I can share it with you after our thing, and we can oh. put a little link under the podcast. Okay, perfect. Yeah. 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 So I think I'm hearing you say that when you're encountering, hmm, we could call it that resistance or that tension or stress in your body, that the first practice is just to notice it and acknowledge, oh, this makes sense. Yeah, and it's okay. And I can be with this. And then maybe under that, we can just trust as we're with our own stress and our body. The body naturally wants to unfold when we're just being with it with warmth and acceptance. Yeah. That breath will extend with that yeah. warmth. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, very much so. Mm. Mm. And, and what's even more important than deep breaths is doing just a tiny bit of, of breath meditation every day, just even one breath of breath, warm breath meditation where you bring your attention to your breath and then you notice that your attention wanders away from your breath. Now, when I started this, this was, uh, this was even worse than body sensations. When I started trying to do a one breath meditation, it was like opening the doors to hell and releasing mm -hmm. the dogs of war that would then tear me apart because mm -hmm. as soon as I would stop, um, being externally focused and move my attention inward, I would become aware of what the scientists call our default mode network. Mm. Which, if you've lived through trauma, your default mode network, it, it, and you haven't had a lot of trauma healing or resonance, then your default mode network is very likely to be self lacerating. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. as soon as you lose the external focus, then your default mode network is like, I don't know how many people have seen that movie, Edward Scissorhands, <laughs> but there you are, your fingers have turned into knives and you're flailing yourself inside mm -hmm. of your own brain, mm. making your brain a very difficult place to live. So as soon as the external focus s stops, then yeah. the internal focus makes room for the lacerating default mode network. I used to read at stoplights because they were too long. Cool. Those that the, those thirty seconds were too long, yeah. and yeah. the the I would start to destroy myself. So yeah. if I kept my external focus on the book, then that would that would keep me from uh, from the hell, the internal hell. Mm, yeah. But what we want to do is just for one breath, 
notice our attention and then and then uh say to it well of course of course you're not staying with the breath you know of course you're being drawn into mm -hmm. the default mode network which actually once we start to do our trauma healing becomes a, a fabulous source of creativity and synthesis mm -hmm. that's what Absolutely. it's supposed to be doing the automatic voice of our brain is supposed to be just sewing us into our daily lives mm. and, and making sure we remember things and coming up with new songs and drafting mm -hmm. novels at streetlights, at stoplights, instead of beating ourselves up. Mm. So, but, but, but this very gentle, just like saying to our, to our attention and our default mode network, well, of course you're beating me up. Do you want to make me better? Yeah. <laughs> do you, do you want to stop me from ever doing yeah. another social so faux pas? Yeah. Would you love for me to learn from my mistakes? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's a couple of things I hear there. That's contextualizing, yeah. right? What's the purpose of that critical voice? And the other thing, just to help link, if my students are listening, to link what you're saying with what I teach, it's just terms, I think, really. When you're saying meet yourself with resonance, I often say you can always be a little bit bigger than the experience you're having. And the moment you do that, you are not in that reactivity. You're yeah. observing it. You can always just be a little bit bigger and hopefully a little bit bigger with warmth, of course. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um and grabbing a few needs energies along the way. Yeah, really helps. Absolutely. Yeah. Can we go back to an earlier point? Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear a little bit more about, I'm imagining someone listening who's heard the comment about, ooh, we're resonators. That means when I get home from work and my children are there or my housemate or whoever, and I've had a bad day and I'm angry and frustrated from my day, I'm going to impact them immediately. Mm. And I don't want to impact my family or my housemates with my negative mood. And I heard you say something about, but it can be okay if you contextualize that negative mood, let's say, or anger. Mm -hmm. Can you say a little bit about that person? They're getting home. They don't want to have the impact. And at the same time, they haven't yet come down from that escalated state right but right and there the, what do they and do? the truth is that it was a hard day yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah well the very first thing as always is um being able to say to ourselves of course i'm grumpy of course mm -hmm. i'm grouchy of course i'm cranky of course, I'm in a state of intense aggravation. Yeah. And, to, and to just like see how our bodies respond to our acknowledgement. And then it's lovely if we can add a couple, you know, a couple needs uh, words for ourselves if we have that practice of like, yeah. boy, I would love to live in a world that was full of cooperation. Mm. I would love to have mutuality and interdependence at work. I would love to be in a workplace where the people I work for, that I could really be certain that they could hold the big picture when they made decisions and that they were thinking of everybody's well-being. Yeah. You know, just like just those, that kind of, almost like with a sewing machine, you've got a needle with the thread on the top layer. And that thread on the top layer is what we see on the sewing machine. Mm -hmm. And then if you turn it over and you look underneath, there's a bobbin that has the bottom layer. And it's like if we allow our sewing needle to, to go deeper and to touch the truths that we, that we long for, then we start, to, we start to have a seam that holds. Yeah. If we are only angry and irritated without allowing our sewing needle to pick up what our longings and our needs are, then just like with a sewing machine, if you don't have any thread in the bobbin, the seam won't hold. Mm. But with that thread in the bobbin and us picking up 
that bottom layer with each stitch, then we have a family that holds. We have relationships that hold. We have, mm. we have self-care that holds. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So getting home, recognizing, oof, right before you go through the door, you're recognizing, oh, I don't want to bring this negative mood home to my family or my housemates, partner. First thing, maybe we don't want to make rules, but we could say first thing, self forms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, consistently useful. Yeah. Oh, of course, I'm stressed. I had a super difficult day. And then because there's something I was wanting that didn't happen. Maybe as simple of that as that, if we don't have a needs vocabulary, of course, I encourage everyone to build a needs vocabulary. You can ask yourself, like, what was I wanting that didn't happen today? Or, yeah, and go there. Yeah, what's that beautiful world that I wish I lived in? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Finding a question that awakens that longing and the energy yeah. of those needs and values. Yeah, finding the question that's right for you. And then even that, even as you come through the door, having contextualized, using your word, your experience for yourself, your energy is already different. Very different. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm imagining it just would be even more helpful for the people in your home if they heard, oh, this is how I am and this is what I was wanting today that didn't happen and I just want to let you know right now that's where I'm at. And that's <laughs> just that little bit of context. It goes yeah. a long way. It lets people know that you're not mad at them. Yeah. As little kids, until they're nine years old, they automatically, their brain automatically thinks it's them which is why yeah. we have lacerating default mode networks is because everybody has been alive before they were nine years old <laughs> so we all have negative uh, messages that are carried over mm -hmm. from our brains not being old enough to realize oh my mom's really stressed because of work it's not because of me mm -hmm. oh, my dad's really depressed because Mm -hmm. uh, things that happened to him in his childhood that he still has not gotten to work on it's not because of me mm. yeah. yeah yeah really helps to understand yeah mm. and we can still do that even if people have kids who are grown we can go back and do that it wasn't because of you yeah that helps too yeah i love that because uh when i think about like what would it have been like if my mom had gotten it like now even now my mom's been dead for 10 or 12 years I'm 60 years old and and I think what would it be like if my mom age 95 mm. were if she were still alive were mm. to, to be were, were to be so held mm. and so resonated with that she would be able to start to sew her own seam mm. <laughs> I wouldn't have to be trying to guess at what that bottom thread mm -hmm. would be and she was able to, to come mm. with, uh, with her own self sewed together. What would that be like for me? Oh, mm -hmm. that would be wonderful. Here I am, 60 years old. That would be sweet for me. So yeah. we can know that if we're the parents of adult children, mm -hmm. that if we do our work, then it makes room for our children to have an entirely different experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it reminds me of my own experience with my mom in which luckily I learned this work a long time ago. And my first project was only empathy for my mom, not repeating the same dynamic. <laughs> I'd had a lot of training by that point and I was living in a monastery. So I also had a lot of focus. Mm. And so every phone call was just empathy. And I had asked over the years, that was really painful when you didn't come and see me during my divorce when I really needed support. And there were certain key moments I had asked my mom to go into with me and she refused. And after that year of only empathy, maybe five or six years later, <laughs> just out of the blue, just like for me out of the blue, she said, I'm sorry I didn't come when you got divorced. I'm sorry. Oh. Oh, such a gift, such a gift. Yeah. yeah. Mm. yeah and I could feel something inside me just went, mm. yeah, just that tiny bit of being seen so sweet from our parents, especially. Yeah. 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 It's a beautiful story.
Thank you so much for being here today with us and with me. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. I wonder if someone says, oh, I want to get to know the Sarah Payton lady. What's a good place for them to kind of dive in with you a little bit more or a baby step in the direction of diving in? Yeah. An easy baby step. An easy baby step is that the um, meditations from the two books are available for a free download on www.sarahpayton.com and www.yourresonantself.com. Great. We can put those below too. So yeah, that'd be wonderful. Yeah. And then if you like to read, then starting out with, with one of the books, if you love really simple, inspiring stuff, then Affirmations for Turbulent Times. If you want to know the neuroscience journey of self-compassion, which is what we were really talking about a lot during this conversation, mm -hmm. that's your resonant self. And then there's this whole other kind of body of work that we haven't even talked about. That's the unconscious contract work, mm -hmm. which is what are the deep relational needs that are in play that are causing us to self-sabotage. Mm -hmm. And that's the your resonant self workbook. Mm -hmm. So if you don't like to read, then... YouTube videos are very fun. <laughs> and if you like to take classes, they're just wonderful, pre both pre recorded and live online classes. Oh, nice. Yeah. And are any of those books in audiobook form? Yes, they, uh, I think that the first two are. Yeah. I don't, I'm not sure about affirmations for turbulent times. I don't think it's in audio. Okay. But the main Your Resonant Self book is audiobook too. Yay, thank you so much for bringing all those resources into the world. Thank you, Lachelle. That's felt so, mm. so fun to be in the same geographic area with you. Yay, yeah. yay, creating a network of light together. Mm -hmm. mm. Radiating love from my heart to yours. Me too. Thank you. You can find free resources and information about Mindful Compassionate Dialogue, as well as Wise Heart's live offerings and self-paced workshops online at www.wiseheartpdx.org. You can also connect with Wise Heart on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube or by emailing info at wiseheartpdx.org.